Hello, and welcome to Scene Shop. I'm Steve McGaw, one of the founders and artistic director of the troupe. I have to tell you, what you will see here is perhaps one of the strangest shows we've ever done. Then again, maybe not. In any case, I can tell you that for all of us in Scene Shop, the prospect of going an entire summer with no show at all was simply unthinkable. And so we resolved to find a way. Please know that you, the audience, are a crucial part of this equation. Now the title and loose theme of the show you're about to see is Here I Am. And the monologues in this show, they're all monologues because we did not want to ask actors and directors to have to meet to rehearse. So the monologues you'll see in this show uh, may speak to ideas of isolation, separation, loneliness, feeling you're one in the crowd, or feeling you're one apart from the crowd, or just knowing that you by God have something to say. There's also some music in the show, and we think that the, the terrain we'll cover is pretty wide. I think there are laughs to be had, perhaps tears to be shed, thoughts to be provoked, and we certainly hope there are some surprises along the way. Before I go any further, let me say this, and I should say it a hundred times, though I won't interrupt the proceedings for this. This show would not be possible without the technical know-how and cooperation and affable leadership of our technical director and digital stage manager, Michael Carver Simmons. He is a gem. All right, let's get on with it. Thank you for joining Scene Shops. Here I am. Enjoy the show. Years old today. Ah, God, I know it's a cliche question, but where does the time go? One day he is our baby, cute and wrapped up, wearing one of those little hats and, and the diapers. Oh! <laughs> the less said, the better. But then it's like the very next day he is our eight year old little man. Years ah. old today. Yeah. Ah. To commemorate his eighth birthday, this big occasion, me and my wife, Sandra, we planned a big party, bigger than I ever had, but it fell through. Thanks, Corona. So instead, we came up with a special at-home movie and dinner celebration. Sandra went out and got all the ingredients for her, her special lasagna, Nate's favorite. Boy, that boy can eat. <laughs> We constructed a huge blanket fort in the living room, and we rented some movies, and we are surprising him with a new Nintendo Switch game. For dessert, strawberry cupcakes, another favorite. It's not the party that we initially had in mind, but all things considered, a pretty good party for Nate. I'll tell you, eight years ago, if you had told me that I was going to be a daddy, I would have laughed at you in your face and I would have ran out of the room. <laughs> it's just not where my mind was. I, I, I was running around, doing my own thing, being kind of selfish, but I didn't have a care in the world other than my money. You see, I couldn't picture myself raising a child. I never tried. I didn't have a father. It was just me and my mom. She was my everything. But when Sandra told me that she was pregnant, 
I thought that she was joking. I, I hoped that she was joking. I, I, I laughed the first couple of times she told me. Then I was mad. I thought that she was trying to sabotage me. But it wasn't until after Nate was born. I, I, I had my doubts, more questions than answers. I mean, I, I, I loved him, but the connection really wasn't there until one morning when Sandra had told me that she needed some me time and that she was gonna go hang out with her sisters. Two seconds later, of course, I hear <laughs> the door close. Quiet. And I'm thinking, all oh, good to go. Yeah, right. I lean back, got my head on the pillow. And then I hear that familiar sound. He's crying. My mate is crying, and I'm the only adult in the house. <laughs> After about four minutes, which seemed like four hours, I finally found the, the notes that Sandra had left for me, letting me know when to feed the baby, where the diapers were, and how to use them. <laughs> but I got to say that it was on that day that I became a father. After changing that baby's stanky diaper and getting sprayed with urine, yes, that happened that I became a father, the father to Nate. You see, I fought against all of the stereotypes. And later that year, I wised up and became a husband to Sandra. And we became a family. You see, Sandra and I are trying to do the best, be the best parents that we can. Try to look at it all and ask the right questions. Does Nate like himself? Does he know right from wrong? Does he treat others with respect? We want to fill him up with as many good experiences as we can. Find out what he likes and what he doesn't. We currently have him enrolled in Little League football and honestly, <laughs> it is pretty hilarious. <laughs> He's also taking piano lessons, which he seems to like. But I have to say the best thing I think is that Nate is always been quiet, the silent type, if you will. But lately, he's been breaking out of that shell, and it's good, but not always easy. See, you're glad when your kid starts to stand up and speak up for himself, but wow, a lot of opinions and a lot of attitudes sometimes. Before that, it was easy. He giggled when he was happy, cried when he wasn't, and, and crying meant that he was hungry or that he was having diaper troubles, my favorite, <laughs> or that he was sleepy and just wanted to be picked up. Easy. But I tell you, when Nate started talking, wow, <laughs> that was amazing. Which he had heard one too many times from me. Adorable, right? But you see, I'm not here talking about just those moments. As Nate got older, as he gets older, it's a process far from done every day. He understands a little bit more about conversation and communication. As every day passes, he learns about speech and the things that tie along in with it. Tone of voice, volume, facial expressions, the, the, the words that people choose to use. With all that comes understanding. And that means understanding some things that I wish that he didn't have to. You see, when Nate was a bit younger, just like now, he loved to learn, and he wanted to learn the names of all of his colors. So we played a game where I would point to something, and he would name the color. Got it right most of the time. But then came one day when we had guessed about just every color in the house, and he pointed to his own skin. Black. You see, 
He knew that he looked just like me and his mother, but that he didn't match everybody in his kindergarten class or the folks on TV or even the folks that he's seeing in the grocery store. You see, he's a smart boy and he was trying to figure out who he was. What made Nate, Nate? When he went to kindergarten, he was so excited that there were boys and girls that looked like him, but even more so excited that there were kids that looked different. Blonde skin, he called him, or brown like his buddy Fernando. It was a little overwhelming to say the least, but he wanted to see it all. He wanted to learn about everything. But then came the day when he came home upset. You see, a boy had told him that they couldn't be friends because he was black. The five-year-old boy said that to my son? You see, I knew that he had gotten that crap from his parents and that that shit has to be learned, but Nate didn't understand it. He didn't understand why. Why on earth should the color of my skin make a difference? That is the question he asked me. The question that he continued to ask me and his mother several times. And we did okay, I guess, in giving enough of an answer to what we thought a five-year-old could understand, but it wasn't easy. And it certainly won't be the last time that he comes to us with a tough question. And it won't be easy then either. He won't be this little boy forever. Right now, at eight years old, Nate loves himself, loves just who he is, loves that he's skinny and that he can eat like a horse, that horror movies don't bother him, and that he currently has the highest grades in his math class. To that, of course, I say, wait till you get to long division. <laughs> Sandra and I tell him every day that he's smart, that he's handsome and that he is kind hearted. We praise him for tying his shoes and give him credit when he, whenever he remembers to pick up his socks. Affirmation is important. But you, you see, his mom and me are not the only voices that he hears every day and we never will be, especially as he gets older. TV, movies, social media, and, and the news, the words that his peers use on the day to day are gonna get more and more of his attention as time goes by. And I can't do anything about that, neither can his, my, my wife. Who knows what he's going to hear? What might be said to him sometime? God, what name some idiot might call him? And when he hears about the next George Floyd or the next Trayvon Martin, what is he going to think? How will he feel? You see, he'll come to me to his mother with all these questions. And we'll have the answers to some, but some we probably won't, but we'll do our best. In the long run, he's gonna have to find the answers to his own questions, just like we all do. But Sandra and I just want to fill him in with as many good truths as we possibly can. Tell him about all the good people in this world, about how there's something bigger than us out there, about how he should love and respect himself, that he should stand up and say, here I am in the face of negativity. Take it or leave it. These are the questions that matter most, the answers that are the most important. Hold on to him.
hold on to them. Take them out and look at them often. Just like snapshots. Okay, first thing, I don't like to bitch. I don't. I take no pleasure in complaining, contrary to what some people might say. My mother would tell you that I am frequently disagreeable. Untrue. She's a lovely person, well-groomed, uh, good taste in shoes, but wrong on this. My father, a bourbon-fueled Abe who pays lip service to the Methodist Church, but whose true religion is a noxious cocktail of capitalism, auto maintenance, and the Dallas Cowboys grunts that I am whiny and bitter. Well, as daddy would say, that's nothing but horse shit. And, and don't listen to my past employers. It's a long history of persecution and unfairness from Darlene, that moronic heifer at Burger King, my degrading entry into the workforce as a naively hopeful 16 year old to the odious Clarence Ferguson, my current employer at Ferguson's Fine Flowers. A duller, less imaginative person you'll never meet, and yet there he is, regarded as a local titan of the floral arts. It's the designers, of course, that have elevated that place, made them the destination vendor for sophisticated flower aficionados. The designers, me, chief among them, but does Clarence recognize my talent or the investment of heart and soul that I put into every arrangement? No. Instead, he chooses to regard me as difficult and irresponsible to quote my last evaluation, all because of some tiny incident that happened on the Saturday afternoon after Thanksgiving. The shop was quiet as a tomb. Nobody shops for or sends her flowers in November, let alone that Saturday. I was the only one there. We hadn't had a soul enter the place in like 90 minutes. So I took a little break. See, we're just blocks from the mall, and I wanted these shoes and knew that they were on sale and down to the last pair. And I'd been waiting for Clarence to pay me, so see, it's kind of his fault, huh? Anyway, I locked the door and I dash over to the mall. I got the shoes, zipped through the drive through Taco Bell, and I was back in an hour. Technically, I was back. I was at the intersection adjacent to the shop when it happened. By it, I mean the incident, and by the incident, I mean when that stoplight turned from green to red way too fast, and the Land Rover in front of me stopped, and I couldn't stop fast enough, and well, they said collision. I'd use the word tapped. They said considerable damage to the rear of the vehicle. I think it was mostly scuffed up paint. Anyway, because I was gone for longer than intended, and because I had taken the shop's delivery vehicle, you see, it was cold, and... My heater was broken and I thought, well, my goodness, it wouldn't do the shop any good if I got a cold and couldn't work. Clarence did not see things the way I saw them. He got completely bent out of shape and went on some tangent about trust, reliability, and company property. Ugh, it was dreadful. Like some scene with my father or my high school principal or that one head counselor at that summer camp. Yes, I still have my job, but... I'm not allowed to have any keys, front door, back door, office, delivery vehicle, needless to say. And worse yet, and most unfairly, my hours were cut. To this, my father suggested that I get another job, part-time. Uh, hello? Have you heard of stress? No thanks. I'm using the extra time to decompress, relax, center myself. And very occasionally Netflix and chill. That's assuming anyone stays around long enough to Netflix and chill. Don't get me started on my exes so many times so many times I put my sweet loving heart on a platter only to be in return on the receiving end of treachery betrayal scorn humiliation and and pain why would anyone want to sell the affairs of the heart with crass concerns for dollars take Zach for instance I never want a remuneration for the cookies I baked him, for doing his laundry, the late night pizzas, or putting him on my Netflix accounts. I didn't want money, that's just the way I am. But all he could complain about 
was what he called my share of that goddamn vacation. What arrangement did you think we had, honey? You texted me saying, want to go to Cabo and say fuck it? I said, sure. That's not exactly what I call a detailed binding contract. We went to Cabo. We stayed drunk. We had fun. End of story. And Zach, you did fuck it. Numerous times. Aggressively. And I can't believe that has no compensatory value at all. Aaron Cohen was another one. Dumped me. Dumped me on New Year's Eve afternoon. And he knew how much those shoes cost. He didn't like it because I called his grandmother a bitch. Well, she was. I'll admit that it was unfortunate that it happened at his little brother's bat mitzvah, but that's just the way it goes. So, happy fucking New Year's, Aaron. You missed out on that midnight kiss and a hell of a lot more. I'll confess, I'm not good with families, but it's a two-way street, and I've tried, really tried. Like when I was seeing Mitch. Every Saturday with his blue-collar family, the TV blaring football in the background, making chit-chat with his grandma, the unchanging menu of backyard barbecues. I was fine with it all. And I could really get behind his mom's bottomless glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> but it all blew up one day whenever I didn't manufacture enough phony interest as his rich father droned on and on about how he had started off repairing cars in the backyard and now owns a hugely profitable chain of non-collision repair centers. Who cares? If you have so much money, Mr. Jackson, buy a decent suit. <sighs> Mitch was furious with me. My dad has worked his fingers to the bone building this business, he screamed. Well, honey, I put a lot of wear and tear on my knees in the service of your entertainment and you don't hear me yapping about it. I have to say, admit, I guess is the word. I do miss him. Mitchell, that is. God, only his dad called him Mitch. I might have messed that one up myself. At least partly my fault anyway. Anyway, so here I am, another Saturday night no money, no boyfriend, no fun. Another sad evening of cheap red wine, spaghetti, Netflix. Maybe some time online before bed. To play games or watch YouTube, nothing else, thank you. Tomorrow, another whirlwind of laundry. Then an excruciating but free dinner with my parents. And at odd moments, I'll just stare into space and wonder why. Why does it feel like the entire universe is conspiring against me to make me... No, no. No more of that. After all, I don't like to complain. I don't like to bitch. These hands used to heal. Holy Spirit used to just flow right through my body, out my fingertips, and into the congregation, into the sick and the wounded, and into some who I don't really think deserved it. They weren't what I'd call good people, you know. Still, I'd give them what the souls needed, because these hands used to heal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, without a doubt in my mind. Right, Holy Spirit? You see, I have a little of that Old Testament blood in me. I can be a bit wrathful and vengeful. Sometimes I can be more than a bit. 
Sometimes my heart would just fill up with so much anger, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to get away from that. Healing the sick was making me sick. I had to heal myself. So one day I just up and left all that behind and I come out here to God's natural world. Nature. The woods. You know what I like best about living in the woods? Well, it's not hiking or hunting or fishing or anything like that. It's breathing. Just breathing. Nothing like filling your nose with the smell of pine to let you know you're really breathing. There's no air like this back in the city. That's long ago extinct. This is the kind of air I used to breathe as a little boy growing up in the country. This is healing air. It healed my tortured soul. Man, it's healing my angry heart. But now, I got this feeling in my gut and this voice in my head telling me that it's time to get back to the city. But it ain't my voice. He wants me to go back because there's a whole world of people that need healing. Like I don't know that. I know that. I just don't want to do anything about it. <laughs> Guess the devil won this round, huh? And why you let it get so bad in the first place? And why you just don't heal it yourself? I don't know. That's a mystery. So what do you do when you hear the call, but you really don't want to answer it? The call. Well, cause the world ain't gold no more. Churches ain't churches no more. They're elaborate, well choreographed Broadway productions with big video screens and a man telling me that God wants me to be rich. And Christians. Well, they ain't Christians anymore. They're just a bunch of sanctimonious, easily seduced, delusional sheep. They don't act like your flock. They act like a pack of wolves. But there was a time. There was a time when it was gold. There was a time when balance and harmony just kind of gleamed down from heaven like the golden rays of the morning sun. And there was a people. There were people here that treasured this creation. They appreciated all the gifts, all the resources. They didn't poison the water. They didn't poison the air. They didn't rape the land. They never hunted for sport. And when they did hunt, the animal they killed, they would take the time to thank the soul of that animal for giving up its life so they could live. They gave thanks. Something I thought you would appreciate. But apparently not, because the true stewards of this land, you just kind of turned your back on them. Don't understand that. I guess that's just another one of those mysterious ways in which you move that we're not supposed to question. Well, can I at least ask you this? Where are all the lightning bugs? Used to be a time when there were so many they could light up a whole forest on a moonless night. I can't remember the last time I even saw one. I like lightning bugs. Nature is a forgotten grace. And that's what this world needs, is the forgotten grace of nature. That's all it needs. Faith? All right, fine, faith. We're gonna need faith, you gotta have faith. You've had her chasing me around my whole life. I thought I'd finally lost her back in the city. But I didn't. I've been seeing her around lately. She's in the corners of my cabin where the candlelight will not dwell. I can lurking around behind the trees. I can hear her in the sound of my guitar. I hear in the sound of the rustling of leaves when the wind blows which it has not done in forever, and it's hotter and blazes down here. <sighs> Faith. She is trying to possess me. That's right, trying to possess me like a, one of them demons in an exorcism movie. That's what she does, so she can use my hands. All right, then. Fine. Fine, you win. I'll go back.
Besides, I miss air conditioning, something awful, and I could use a new set of strings. And I want a goddamn Whataburger. All right, then. I don't know where you're going to use me this time, but I, here I am. Here I am, your somewhat humble servant. But I want to tell you something. I was not hiding from you. This is never about hiding. This is about self-preservation. This is about letting that wild horse run free. It's about me getting away from all that and finding what I've been missing. This is about me finding you. And I guess, while I was at it, letting you find me. Morning, everyone, and welcome back to another day in the wonderful life of distance learning. I think I've got just everybody in here. Um, here we are at the end of our, what is it, first week? Really? Has it only been a week? End of our first week, and we're all making good progress. I appreciate your notes and your emails, and um, I know this is very difficult, learning theater via Zoom. But you know what's even harder than that? Teaching theater via Zoom. So, um, for those of you who asked, what is all of this? I'd be happy to explain that. This, which all graduates, except for PhDs who get to pick their own hat, um, wear a mortar board. I do not know the history of that. I think it's so that we all look equally terrible. Uh, the tassels are usually for the year in the school. You generally only wear one at a time, which brings us to the academic collars. The, co the collars indicate the school and what you majored in. And traditionally, you only wear one at a time, but I have those diplomas and credentials just hanging around, so I thought I might as well both. And these are thespian cords. You will learn more about the thespian society as you move into high school. Now, the gown is just the general unflattering thing that everybody wears, also a big equalizer, but the master's robe has this cool little bat wing thing. I can't fly with it, that would be too cool. But a friend of mine used it to sneak in a Game Boy to his graduation. A Game Boy is a handheld game console, which we used in the dark days, when all we had were flip phones and the only thing we could play on them was Snake. Ask your parents, it's hilarious. So, anyway, um, I want to remind you that a great title is a great way to pull in your audience. Caroline, Mexican Death Frog really drew me in and your story was quite charming. My notes to you are in orange on your Google Doc. Cade, your, your character's journey from professional actor to homeless man to Walmart cashier was really, really good. Um, see if you can come up with a good title. Caroline, Mexican Death Actor is not gonna do it. So, work on those titles. And remember that even though I am not there with you, you know where to find me. Here I am. And hello students. Welcome to the end of, is it really just the second week of distance learning? Please, please, please check your emails for return notes. You should now be at the research point for your monologues. I know you cannot go to the library. Did any of you go to the library when we were in school? It's right there across from the boys' bathroom in the 8th grade building. Oh yeah, the room with the books in it? Okay, so you're doing your research from home, I'm assuming on the device on which you are now learning. Uh, the assignment is to research something about yourself. Go through your day-by-day uh, -day steps Aiden, I appreciate the picture of the pool and the plate of tacos, and my, they did look inviting. But I want to know a little bit more. You said you made tacos. What went into the process of building the tacos? Great. Now we're all hungry. Uh, Alexis, I love how you use the decorations in your room as a metaphor to the walls closing in around all of us during this time of quarantine. Oh, that wasn't intentional? Nah. Happy accident. You are all doing terrific work. 
please do not feel that you have to wait till the last minute to finish the assignment. We know we're going to have at least three more weeks of distance learning. But use your, t your time wisely. It is a fun thought to have all 158 of you send me your stories at the same time. But it's not likely to do much to improve my mood or cherub-like demeanor. And trust me, you will need me to be happy when I grade your assignments. I love you all. Even though I'm not there with you, here I am in front of the computer, slowly going mad. And we're back. Actually, I didn't go anywhere. I still in my I'm still in my house by myself with the cats. Okay. Hey there. What week are we on? Who's got a calendar? I think I do. Fourth week. Huzzah! By now you have heard that we are going to be winding down this school year from our homes. It is a challenging, nay, thrilling prospect. I really appreciate the moment work you're doing with your monologues. Jackson, your family's morning announcements are a great, great resource for further information. Maybe pick a couple of really interesting ones and the amount of bacon every day. I I'm going to need some verification on that. Please ask your mother, your father, or your brother to please verify that you are eating almost a pound of bacon every day. Thank you. Um, Lulu, the story of the dolphin on the beach. Pretty delightful. Um, but think about it for a minute. Does the dolphin really need to talk? Caroline, it's not a Mexican death dolphin. Okay, any questions? What's behind me? That is a giraffe. His name is Reynaldo. He is holding my sweater for the next brisk day. I know it is May. He is very patient. If there are no other questions about my decor, what, you're going to ignore the monkey in the sombrero over here? Uh, I love you all. And remember, even if I'm not there with you, I am here. Okie dokie, artichokies. It's great to see you on what has to be the millionth day of learning. Gary, those are some amazing slippers. And they glow in the dark too. Awesome. So let's just get those lights back on so we can get back to work. Your monologues turned out great. Ella, remember you do not have to write more than 10 pages. A monologue is generally performed by one actor. And while the story was really good, um... Having one actor talk for 90 minutes in a one-way conversation is too much like a faculty meeting for the general public to be able to enjoy. Okay, for this week, I want you all to dig a little deeper. I don't mean up your nose, Aiden. I know the masks makes your nose itch. But since you're at home, you don't really need to wear it. Oh, but it's comfortable. And it hides you picking your nose. Oh, that's a genius. Thank you. So, but what I mean by dig a little bit deeper is to go back, look at your character in your monologue, and can you do, add a second character, or would that improve the story? For example, Emma, your character argued with her ballpoint pen. Maybe the pen could argue back. And maybe some paper clips could jump in on the fun, or a thumbtack, and say, what's the point? <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, welcome to back to the bazillionth day of distance learning. I am appreciating all of the emails. I do have more than one of these shirts, and I haven't been sitting here wearing the same shirt and the same sweatpants for two months. I do appreciate the concern, though. Um, I am actually doing re really well, stability-wise. And thank your parents for their inquiry. I am taking advantage of online counseling. Very, very impressed with the work you've turned in. You officially have another week. But if you've got a final draft, go ahead and send it in. Love you all. Stay safe. I'm here. You're there. <sighs> really, I just finished class. Oh. oh, Aiden, I love you too.
Janelle. Um, life's insane, huh? <laughs> yeah, life is crazy. Insane. Uh, bananas, nuts, uh, cuckoo. So, I am making you this video, and I am glad you are watching it, Janelle. Uh, yeah, glad you are watching Janelle. Because it's been kind of hard to get your attention. Uh-huh. Your attention, Janelle. Uh, because I, I need some feedback here. Uh, about my updates on the case updates on the case your case Janelle <laughs> I mean shit you I'm sorry I have a bit of a bad mouth but you know what I'm talking about here right I, I mean, sure you do it's all good though it's all good because life has been rough. I know. I'm living that life. That COVID life. COVID lifestyle. Uh, locking it down. Social distancing. Masks. Wearing a mask when I go out now, which is not often. No, it is, it is not good to go out. Janelle, as you know from my updates, if you've read any of my updates, you know, uh, because this virus thing, it's a pandemic. And that is as serious as a heart attack. And I'm just putting everything out there. Everything is fucked up. Yeah, yeah, I said it. Everything has been thoroughly corona fuckified. Life is fucked up. All of us. And... Excuse me. <coughs> wow. Uh... <laughs> Excusez-moi. Sustenance has arrived. Um... It is some fuel. So... Where was I? Yes. Life is fucked up for all of us. Uh, I know that. You know that. We both know that. Um, oh my God. 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 I said it. I said. I said. I said. I said so many times. I said. I said it. I wanted taco sauce. I said. I, I wanted seven. Seven packets. I said. I said. I said. I said I wanted seven packets of Del Scorcho sauce. I mean, who eats this crap without the sauce? God. Oh my god. This. This. That. That. This. This is huh, why I am making this video Janelle. Because this COVID has everyone messed up and no one can, you know, get their job done anymore. You know? 
what I'm saying here. Uh, the 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 COVID it, it, it's it's locked down inside people's brains, making us all crazy. It's, it's got it so that nobody can get their shit. Excuse me, done right, uh huh? With this COVID going on and on and on and on and on and on and on, you know, you know, you know, you know. You know, you totally know because of the case. You know because of the status of the case. Our case. Janelle, ah. Uh, maybe if I was some kind of online whatever online person who does online things online you know uh the techity people with their tech 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 maybe this case would be moving along it might even be cracked by now you know things would be uh different Um, but I'm a hands-on guy. You know that. <laughs> it's how I got my rep. My reputation. I gotta be up close and personal to do the kind of work I do. The kind of work I do best. I know that there are other people in the private investigation industry and they undertake their private investigations by clicking away on some keyboard or or uh, texting it up on their fancy iPhone 11 Max Pro. That's not how I roll. I am and pardon moi, fucking old school. I get all up in people's business. I'm the guy that they see staring back at them in their rearview mirror. 2 a.m., just outside the window, when they finally decide to draw the curtains. That's me, Delroy does not back down. Delroy watches and waits. Delroy unafraid. But you know that. <laughs> you knew. When you first came in here, my office, back in March before all this coronavirus baloney, you knew. You sought me out. You chose me. Because the heart knows what the heart wants. And yours. Yours wanted Delroy Del Rio. Private Detective Delroy Del Rio formerly of the LAPD. You knew that I had, that I have what it takes to locate the whereabouts of that, that skank machine, your ex-boyfriend, and get back for you, your beloved Lhasa Apso, and your 2016 Toyota Yaris. With the custom millennial pretty princess pink paint job? You know that I'm the man. Delroy gets results. Because you did the research. You did your detective work. 
you cried out into the wilderness. Google budget-friendly investigations. You found me. And I got to admit, it gave me literal life, Janelle. To have someone with real class come in here. It, uh, it was like, oh, you ever see Chinatown? Not the neighborhood. I am talking about a film. Uh, it, it, is, it is a classic detective movie. Finely made film. Uh, I think it's on Hulu. Do you have Hulu? Anyway, uh, you should watch it. It's about this guy. And he is, he is like the greatest detective ever. Jake. And Jake. He's sitting in his office, like I was, right? Back in March. Uh, and this, this really classy lady comes in and uh, she is just like you just like yeah if she'd been wearing Daisy Dukes and red leather boots she'd have been your spitting image huh but you came in here to the office of Delroy Del Rio you told me your story, shared your pain. You gave me $500 up front and you trusted me to hit the ground running, to put together the pieces of your shattered dreams. And I got to admit, I, f I feel like I've let you down. Janelle, uh, yeah, I do. Um, this COVID has stopped me dead in my tracks. I, I, yeah, it has. I'm dead. I am deadlocked. And I'm scared. Um, I am scared of what that skank machine might be planning. What he, what he, what he might do. What he might be doing right now. You know, I am. I am scared for you, and for your lots of opsa, and your Toyota Yaris. But, 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 I am not a man who gives in to fear. No. I have the ability to feel things very deeply. But that does not make me weak. I am going to find you. I am not going to give up on you, Janelle. Because I know that you would never give up on me. I'm going to find you. We are going to be together. It is going to be you and me and your Yaris and your Lhasa Apso. And I bet... Mr. Cuddleshanks is one hell of a dog. Best damn dog that ever lived. We're going to be a family, Janelle. I think you've always known that. Yep. When you first came in here way back, I think you knew. Did I know? 
I mean, way back then. <laughs> yeah. I think I did. But it's like my mama always said. You can't hurry love. No, you just have to wait. <laughs> God, sweet God, you hang in there, Janelle. <laughs> I know there is something evil keeping us apart because there is no good reason why you would not have responded to my 162 emails, 96 messenger messages, the 77 text messages, my friend requests on Facebook. I mean, are you in a bunker? Does that skank machine have you in a bunker? Oh God, baby, baby, I keep having this dream that you are in a bunker, baby, and I don't even know when to <laughs> ah, uh, But, but if this video, if this video can, uh, if you are able to watch this video, if this video can reach you, then I can reach you. And I'm going to find you, Janelle. We are going to be together. I am going to put on an N95 surgical grade respiratory mask and I am getting back out there. And I am going to hit these streets old school style. And I won't sleep until we are together. And I want you to know, I don't even log the hours anymore. I don't. I don't know if you've noticed, if you have internet down there in the bunker, but I haven't charged your PayPal account in months now. Because this is my labor of love for you, Janelle. Because Delroy is the man, your man, the man with the plan. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm, what does tomorrow even bring? Do we even, are we, do we even think about tomorrow? Do we dare? Is that even still allowed? What? <sighs> this is Delroy Del Rio, private detective. Signing off for now. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, last thing. Janelle. Is Mr. Cuddleshanks there with you? I'm just... I would like to think that he is. Uh... I would like to imagine that he is there uh, and he's just resting his head on on one of your red leather boots. I, uh, uh, and Janelle, wherever you are, from the bottom of my heart, You have Hulu. Over and out.
dear. Hello. Hi. Hi, all. I'm writing this review today because I have something I need to say. First, this is the review of the Greyhound Bar and Grill I should have left six months ago. I regret not writing it back then. Five stars. A cheeseburger that is pure heaven. In short, the beauty of this burger lies in its simplicity. One six ounce beef patty, perfectly seared on a seasoned flat top grill with a crust no one could ever replicate. While crispy on the outside, it's a perfectly juicy medium rare on the inside. The soft potato bun is masterfully toasted and one slice of American cheese combines all the flavors into one delicious, greasy bite. Yes, that's right. American cheese. No bacon jam spread, no brie, and for God's sake, please no arugula. Okay, these things, they, they belong on salads. Shredded iceberg lettuce, three pickle slices, and one thick slice of raw onion. That's it. Nothing here falls apart. Each bite sets itself up for the next. This burger is neither an innovation nor a culinary phase. It's a symbol for what's always been good and right in the world. Sincerely, Carl Rogers. Or maybe I wouldn't have put my last name. I, I, don't, I don't know. Hmm. But now, but now, this is something I need to say because everyone needs to know the truth, especially Mark, the owner. One star. A tragic effing letdown. This Greyhound Bar and Grilled Cheeseburger sucks. It sucks so much. Out of nowhere, they've replaced their classic six ounce burger with the ever popular trending double smash burger. Well, guess what, Greyhound Bar and Grill? You created a double piece of shit. I'm not sure if the chef died or the owner changed, but whoever's running the show has decided to fix what was certainly not broken. And my only question is why? Might as well be topped with bacon jam spread and arugula because nothing here works at all. I guess the cook in the back is either too lazy to care or maybe he forgot to take his Adderall because neither patty has the fucking crispy crust the six ounce patty had. Even worse, they cover up these under seasoned patties with a farm full of vegetables and cheddar cheese, which you know, only helps everything slide around. So by the time you pick it up, everything falls apart. You can't jam all that shit in there and expect the bread not to break, especially if you don't toast the bun. They've also <laughs> decided to revamp their fries and make them from scratch with organic potatoes. Ooh, give me a fucking break. When I crave a burger and fries, I'm not trying to, you know, eat clean or look cool. I, I just want a decent side of fries with my burger. These handmade side fries are, are, are limp, cold, and four dollars more than the original. Don't treat us like children. That's insulting. The Greyhound Bar and Grill lacks decency, self-awareness, and compassion. It's a damn disgrace this place took my money and my time. So Mark, if you're reading this, please feel free to give me a call to discuss. Sincerely, Carl Rogers, 
And now, a word from our sponsors. Hey folks, what are you doing? Come on down to Mito's. We're the original no-frills family-style restaurant powered entirely by meat. Now come on, let's get to the good stuff. Let's meet our meat. You won't believe it till you try it. it. The traditional meat shape. A tall glass of chilled, well done, and not too bad ground chuck, or if you prefer, ground Lucy, because we're not gender biased around here, it all comes out the same way. The meat salad. This salad doesn't need spinach to feel substantial. That's the job of our world famous sausage croutons. The hot chocolate Mito. Always on the menu to enjoy before, after, and during your meal. Call now to reserve our lovely private dining room for your next corporate function, family reunion, child's birthday party, wedding reception, Hell, we even do weights. <laughs> now feast your eyes on our menu. From our gotta see em to believe em Mito cones with that buttery mashed potato center, or if you're feeling loco, just yell Mito me and we'll upgrade those taters to chorizo and you'll go home even happier. <laughs> then we've got the offer you'd better not refuse. Pasta a la Mito. Served with our special Mito's house-made pasta. It's the only all-meat pasta on the planet. Get it either bow tie, farfalle, or classic spaghetti. Ooh la la. Don't ever say we don't do fancy at Mito's. From the Mito's no cheese please mmm cake to the savory eat them by the basket if you wanna, Mito's Balls. A worldwide family pleaser for any occasion. Wanna hear more? You, you bet, bet we do. do. We don't just cater to large groups either. Single or double meat eaters are also welcome. And don't even think for a second that you have to leave your non-meat eater friends and family members home with the dogs. Nope, we got them covered too. At Mito's, we proudly offer unlimited trips to the Mito's sidecar, which hosts a wide assortment of sides, including all the white bread that a dying man can choke back. Always remember, when our customers use Mito's puns on any of our staff at any time, they will always get 10% off. Because for us, meat's got no other spelling no matter the context. God bless Mito's! During the merry meaty holiday season, kids eat free when they sing the official Mito's holiday anthem. Come all ye meaty gentlemen at the Mito's family hearth. Folks, here's the deal. I founded Mito's because of my late night sweats, my guts knotted in fear that we might, as a country, as a God-fearing people, be losing our connection to meat. I mean it. If we're not eating meat, and lots of it, are we still America? For us at Mito's, meat consumption is a sacred, time-honored tradition, passed down from one generation to another. I remember my mama's meatloaf. Mm. I can recall that my Uncle Lester's chili was so thick you had to stir it with a baseball bat. And I, I can get choked up just thinking about granddaddy's pork chops. We don't think it negatively impacts the earth or humanity or the ozone or the stars above or whatever the hell those celery eating snowflakes want to whine about next. Meat consumption is the way it's supposed to be. The way God Almighty intended. Eat meat. Eat meat. Hell, those two words rhyme. What greater sign from God do you need? Meat is what keeps us going. Meat is what powers our lives. Meat by God keeps the lights on. We eat meat not because of our political persuasion or our diverse selection of Christian churches, our pro football affiliations, or even which side we fall on the hot button issue of loving Willie Nelson despite his leftist leanings. No, hell no. We do it because we are endowed by our creator to eat, to eat his other creations. That's enough talk. Now belly up to the table and get yourself some meat before it gets cold. I won't say before it's all gone, because <laughs> at Mito's, hell, that ain't ever going to happen. Now come on, get your asses in the truck or car and get on down to Mito's. We're located just south of Waco, just exit Hewitt Drive, go past the Crestview RV Park, 
Wave at the fellers at Earl's Conoco Station, and there we are. See you soon. This one is called Just Gotta, and it goes something like this. Listo, Pancho? Oh yeah, look, he's ready. <clears throat> Life can be confusing when you just can't win for losing, sad but true. It'll make you blue, and when your heart is hurting, it'll surely send you searching for a clue on what to do. Seems like failure follows all I try. But there's one thing that helps me to get by. I can't see into the future, can't remember the past. I'm just stuck in the present. And my 
my hope starts to fade When my life ends me lemons I can still make lemonade I may not know where I'm bound, babe Clouds still hinder my view But in your eyes this clear blue sky Hey! 
turn to my loved ones Seek shelter from the storm That's love Dear Mark, I see my previous post has caused quite the uproar. I gave you my number in case you wanted to talk man to man. I expected to hear from you. But if you want to hide behind your screen, that is your choice. I will say this is something I need to say. You're an asshole, and your burger is pure shit. It's an embarrassment. It's, it's a degradation. It's an insult to humanity. You've not only ruined a burger, you've ruined my neighborhood.
Hello? Yes, this is him. Hi, Mark. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Hmm. What, why? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, Mark. Was I not clear enough? No, no, I, I, I just, I, I don't understand why you have to change things, okay? I, I just don't understand your, your mode of thinking. A lawyer? Whoa, 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 no, nothing I said is, is slander. I'm just, I'm reporting the facts. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, are you still there? Have you ever heard the saying, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Right. Well, you're fucking broken, Mark. And, and you're a terrible fucking excuse for a manager, and, and, and I hope that your entire restaurant burns to the fucking ground, okay? No. No, I didn't mean that. No, 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 no. I, I, I did not. Mark, I did not mean that. But I do seriously hope your wife takes one good look at you when you come home tonight and she leaves you for being a dumbass. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. I'll come over there anytime, any place. You name it. You yuppie catering piece of shit. You still there? Oh, okay. Hello, my fellow Truth Warriors. My name is Parker Worthington, and as always, this is the Parker Report. As you all can see, things look a little different this week. Uh, it's for the first time in the history of the Parker Report. I am broadcasting live, not from the studio, but from my home. This is a measure that our producers thought was necessary. We all hope you are able to enjoy our program despite this massive inconvenience. Our main story tonight. The Chinese coronavirus has been rampaging around the United States. Well, at least, that is what the lamestream media would have you believe. The day-to-day -day of the virus news seems very much unpredictable, as even certain states that previously pledged to reopen are actually now unreopening. Despite this unpredictability, some truths ring true. Truths that we at this program have been saying for months now. Many, especially those on the left, have been telling us that the quote-unquote safety measures are not the sort of thing we should be debating at all. They claim that the data is obvious and that this is a black and white moral issue. These people claim that anybody who disagrees with these social distancing measures is simply being nonsensical. Well, as you all know, I am not afraid of being called nonsensical. If we lose our ability, ability to debate one thing simply because the evidence supposedly points one way, we might as well throw in the towel on civil discourse and all together and grab our weapons. I know I certainly have mine ready. If disagreeing with orders to wear masks, a mandatory muzzle meant to drown out our individual lion's roar of freedom is wrong, then I guess I will gladly be wrong. Now, Lenny here... Shit. Shit. I mean, darn. Darn. Not the other word. My apologies. <laughs> uh, my PA, Lenny, is the only member of my crew who agreed to come to my home for the shooting. I am normally loose to a, uh, used to a much larger crew. Now, this sheet that Lenny just handed me has some numbers I would like to run down for you. Several of our sources tell us that during 2019 in the continental US, there were around 80,000 deaths from the flu. As of our recording this video, the Wuhan coronavirus is responsible for around 150,000 in... Damn it, Lenny. It's a wrong paper, wrong, uh, wrong sheet. And we cut that one. We 
Cut that. Now, as of our recording this, the COVID-19 death rate is around 5.3%. The flu, by comparison, killed 11% who contracted it in 2019. I'm sorry, everyone, I misread that. The flu, sir, uh, the flu's mortality rate is 0.11%. Are you trying to make us look dumb? Huh? Well, fine then. Leave, you goddamn idiot. I'm so sorry for the interruptions, everyone. We are back, this time with the proper facts. The tractors are pointing to the spiking numbers in states like Arizona, Texas, and Florida when they decided to reopen ahead of expert opinions. But I have to ask... Why not look at states like Montana, Alaska, or even American Samoa, which at the time of this recording has recorded zero deaths? Could it be they don't point to those states and territories because of massive differences in population density? Of course not. They refuse to talk about the few places these viruses can get to because it ruins their narrative. It ruins the narrative of fear and isolation that they want to instill in our discourse. Those among us who are, smart, who are smart know the truth. Physical separation is an extension of political separation. They want us physically apart from each other to keep us from coming together to rise up. Physical masks are an extension of muzzling our freedom of speech. The masks strips away our individuality. Let us not forget that over 99.9% .9 of communication is nonverbal. To take away Half of all facial expressions out of the equation is to remove built-in social protections. How do we know if a business partner is lying? How do we know if a politician is clearly not comfortable with something in a debate? For Christ's sake, how do we know if children will be able to tell who a pedophile is and isn't? To top it all off, there is no logic behind even wearing masks in the first place. I have one question for the mainstream media. If the masks are successful in stopping the spread of COVID, why do we even need to shut down? If the masks are able to stop the disease, why do we need to stand six feet apart? Because of all of this, the masks themselves have become a political statement. To wear a mask is, to, is almost as if to wear the opposite of the MAGA hat. It is as if to say, hey, I am okay with the New World Order, George Soros, and the globalist agenda. This is okay. It falls upon us to look, toward, look, to look towards Alaska and say, no, I won't let fear stop me from eating at a packed Applebee's. Here I am, taking a stand for us, taking a stand for America. I hope all of you are willing to stand with me when I say I would rather die a free American who can go to my favorite sports clips than live as a slave being suffocated by a mask. We will be right back after this word from our sponsors. Ooh, that was rough. <laughs> That was rough. Hey. Hey, Lenny. No. No. Man, be quiet. Okay, listen, I, uh... I, I feel bad for, uh, blowing up on you. I, I didn't mean to blow up on you like that on the air. It's, it's unprofessional and... You know, with the divorce and the custody stuff, I... Me yelling about... Me yelling at you had nothing to do with you. You know, it... It had to do with me. Us troop warriors, we gotta, we gotta stick together, man. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> a, uh, yeah, sure, this disease might kill a lot of the old idiots who watch this show, but, uh, is it worth it if my stock portfolio, portfolio recovers? Duh.
Well, if you're watching, you're watching a commercial. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that little skit Lenny and I planned. Uh, we thought a, a little bit of humor, no, not not even humor, a satire might uh, uh, lighten the mood. And uh, that is my boss. Okay, <laughs> this is uh, Parker Worthington. Uh, and if I'm extremely lucky, uh, hopefully I will be checking back in with you all after a word from our sponsors. If not, well, well, stay village, uh, uh, d uh, di uh, diligent, my fellow truth warriors. Well, I just had a really great conversation with Mark over at the Greyhound. I wanted to take a minute to reflect on our conversation, highlight our differences, and start a dialogue about how to move forward. Thank you, Mark, for your willingness to talk. After all, we're all neighbors here on this wonderful planet. When I wrote The Greyhound Burger was a disgrace and an insult to humanity, uh, what I meant to say was that the new Smash Burger is really uh, pretty decent. It has meat and cheese and toppings and you can eat it. As I, as I stated, as I stated emphatically in my previous post, the original Greyhound cheeseburger was a work of art, pure and simple, and I stand by that. But I suppose someday the Mona Lisa will come down. You can't hang on to greatness forever because I guess that's unsustainable uh, in a world that demands you know, whatever this one demands. I understand you feel the need to constantly satisfy a younger clientele. You have to adapt. Um, you have to grow. You have to move on, even if you can't seem to. Uh... I have a confession to make. I am not the cheeseburger connoisseur I claim to be. That award uh, goes to my wife, Kate. Kate can, uh, she could run circles around Bourdain, Fieri, you name it. Drives me crazy. She could talk about anything. I don't know, the symphony, basketball, sex, whatever. And never coming across as pretentious she knew how to make me smile. She knew how to light up her room. What I didn't know is that our cheeseburger at the Greyhound Bar and Grill would be our last meal together. Um, the last time I could look at her in her big brown eyes and hear her say, I love you more.
Kate suffered from a brain aneurysm last June in the parking lot at the Target. It was a Sunday and she was 31 years old. We had a bunch of errands to do, which I wasn't excited about, but she promised me I'd be rewarded with an amazing cheeseburger. So I went. Photos are still up um, all over the house. Um, haven't touched a thing. The closet, everything is still there. I just can't. <laughs> when you've only been married for three months and you think you have a whole life together, um, it's just, it's so hard. It's so hard to find that one thing, that one memory that, that puts us back together again. She taught me to experience so much, not just food, certainly not just cheeseburgers, but she never thought to teach me how to live in a world without her. And now here I am, and I only have time on my hands. I'm sorry, Greyhound, for calling you out. And Mark, I'm, I'm sorry. I admit that was out of line. Um, I tell you what, Greyhound, I will be back for dinner soon. But maybe I'll try your wings next time. Sincerely, Carl Rogers. comet up there now. Somewhere. They say we're gonna see it soon. It's called Neowise. If I want to see it, I have to see it this time around because it's not gonna be back for 7,000 years. We saw Halley's Comet back in 1986. Me, Mom, and Dad. My dad said, enjoy the sight. He said, you are witnessing something recorded by Chinese astronomers who lived before Jesus written of by ancient Greeks and medieval European chroniclers. An image of the comet is described in Babylonian records. My dad told me that the comet inspired the famous Italian painter Giotto's rendering of the Star of Bethlehem in the Adoration of the Magi. It also inspired a tattoo I got on my back when I turned 18. <laughs> I need my car, but I can't pay you right now. I, I need to get to, uh, I need to get to the bank to, to get money, and I, I need money to get. I need to get to the bank so I can get money. But I can't get to the bank until I get to the DMV. I need an ID, and I can't get to the DMV until. Okay, you get it. Uh, what? The bank isn't taking in-person customers. DMV either. Since when? Are you sure? Even with a mask? Ugh, great. Well, look, Ray, um, can we work something out? I mean, you've let me before and I've been good for it. I know you're trying to run a business. Oh, come on, Ray, I've got a job, too, if you count cat sitting. I, I just need my car, bruh. And, and I need groceries. I can't live without groceries. And cat food? The cats are down to their last fistful of crunchies. And a haircut, how, how am I gonna get a haircut? Toilet paper? Yeah, why? Of course I have toilet paper. But why? I mean, and then? Is there a shortage? Oh, people are just so, ugh. Okay, Ray, I'll, I'll call you back, but I need my car. Shakespeare warned of comets as heralds of doom or change. 
So, the brand spanking new comet appearing out of nowhere in 2020 does not surprise me one bit. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves bring forth the death of princes. Uh-oh. Watch out, Prince Andrew. Okay. How to make a mask. So I need a t-shirt, scissors, two rubber bands. Okay. No, mm, uh, I don't want to cut that one. My Bowie t-shirt, Hogwarts, Space Cat, Bat Cat. Nah, I'll just make it later. <laughs> hey! No! No, 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 no! The kids have to have their clown visits. We can social distance in the van, somehow. Oh no, the gig can't be cancelled. All my clowning workshops are cut now. Now is the time for funny clowns, more than ever. I know. Funny clown wearing a mask is just too damn sad right now. Okay. All right. I understand. Be safe. Be safe and stay home. If I don't stay home, my friends will kill me. I'll be labeled reckless and troublesome, deleted from many friends lists, erased from history like a statue of Yosemite Sam. If I stay home, I'll be safe. Bored, but safe. Unless the virus is in here with me right now, Strangling me without me knowing it. Blackening my lungs with tentacled coronavirus filth. It's scary out there. Now they say some big cat's got it. A big tiger in New York. Even some dogs howling away in nameless suburbia. You ever wonder why they don't test lizards? Mm-hmm. Reptile people. They watch out for their own. Now, don't get me wrong, and don't look at me like my W. Bush-loving grandma or my gun-toting Uncle Brawler, but there's something different in the air. Clear as day. It's like the atmosphere has a slightly different color to it. Clear as day. It's like when you wear a tie-dye shirt for so long, the colors have faded and it goes back to white, but you still remember it. You still see it how it once was, back before it had color, back when it had color. It's kind of the way I see the world, how it was before all the fighting, before all the killings and shootings were all over the news, before the riots and protests and more killing and protests and riots and when a cop car coming down the street made me feel safe. Officer Willow and his smile and wave. <laughs> he found my cat for me once, Mr. Mephisto, back when I was a kid. Walked all the alleyways till he found him. That cat got in a fight with a mutt named Gypsy. Officer Willow took him to the vet, got Mr. Mephisto all fixed up, paid for it himself. Didn't even ask my mom to pay him back. <laughs> Officer Willow, Mr. Mephisto. They're both gone now. They never made it out of the 80s. Hmm, <laughs> the 80s. <laughs> back. Before the social media wars, before the trolls took over and the Russians came back, when people were people and love was blind and <laughs> your little kid world was so small nothing mattered except your parents, your cousins and your pets. Here I am in 2020, <laughs> the future, it caught up with us, huh? I'm here, but I want to be back in 1984. Back when it was all <laughs> shopping mall Saturdays, and off the shoulder sweaters, leg warmers, bangles, hoop earrings, Duran Duran, Culture Club, Tears for Fears, Bowie. 
drive-in movies, hot dogs, popcorn, ice cold Coca-Cola, the yummy fuzzy, fizzy way it would taste on summer nights in the back of dad's pickup, watching Jaws or Grease or Close Encounters, going to the beach with the cuzzies, Shakespeare in the park, concerts in the garden, in my backyard and my dog, Missy, and my cats, Spridal and Chim Chim. Just sharing the backyard with the animals and the barbecue grill. And my first telescope in the night sky, the constellations, and the wonders of the unknown. I remember when I was a little girl, just sitting outside, looking up at the beautiful night sky, with my mom and dad, and my dog and cat waiting for comments. Hi. Um, I imagine I'm not the only one who uh, isn't at the actual funeral because of the uh, pandemic, so I'll try not to be too long-winded. It's kind of be kind of hard to boil down everything I feel about Mary Charlotte into two to three minutes. That's what we all get, right? Two or three minutes. Two or three minutes. Anybody actually listening to me? because I'm imagining people on their phones, people looking out the window, people picking their hangnails, because seriously, who wants to hear from Mary Charlotte's angry asshole brother who left the church, am I right? You know what Jesus says in uh, Luke 6? Love those who hate you. We had to work really hard to get me to hate you. She succeeded. So, Love those who hate you. Here I am. Love me. <laughs> oh, and uh, by the way, it's uh, it's not it's not Mary. It's um, it's Mary Charlotte. Charlotte was our uh, our great aunt. Emphasis on the great. She died of uh, cervical cancer about a month before Mary Charlotte was born. Our uh, mother wanted to name Mary Charlotte after the mother of our Lord Jesus. My father wanted to name her after Aunt Charlotte. And uh, yeah, Aunt Charlotte was a, uh, a lesbian and no Bill. That doesn't mean she got what she deserved. I'm gonna call you Bill, not Reverend Sperry. Because uh, Reverend, no. No. Aunt Charlotte was a very cool person. You should read the book she wrote about living in San Francisco, back when you could get arrested for being a lesbian. It's pretty great. You won't read it, but you should read it. And yeah, she inspired me to leave your church from beyond the grave. And I can't believe Mary Charlotte let you talk her into taking the Charlotte off her name because Aunt Charlotte was better than any of you. Knowing Aunt Charlotte was an in-your-face lesbian back in the day was the only thing that kept me alive sometimes as a gay man. Yeah, as a gay man. Jesus didn't cure me, Bill. Maybe I didn't pray hard enough. Is that what you told Mary Charlotte when her cancer came back? That you didn't pray hard enough? Oh, and uh, thanks for warning Mary Charlotte's boys to stay away from me because I would molest them. I used to babysit for Trevor and Jamie. And now that they're adults, they've cut off communication with me completely. So thanks for that. No one's going to listen to this shit. Hi. 
Um, I imagine I'm not the only one who uh, isn't at the actual funeral because of the uh, pandemic, so I'll try not to be too uh, long-winded. Um, so uh, about Mary Charlotte, uh, we, we called her Mary Charlotte, not, uh, not Mary. Uh, Mary Charlotte worked with the Head Start program, which is a federally funded organization working to break the cycle of poverty. So they teach parents about uh, how to feed their children nutritious food on a budget. They teach them child rearing skills, uh, teach them how to support their children in their studies, support their children in staying in school, looking after people living in poverty. You know, the commie socialist bullshit Jesus actually talked about, not the prosperity gospel bullshit that Reverend Sperry teaches you. You know, one of the things I really respected about Mary Charlotte is she never let any of you talk her into quitting that job, and I know you tried. Because why should our tax dollars be going to something that actually does something good in the world instead of buying more military planes that sit out in the Arizona desert rusting? But she didn't quit. You know why? Because she wasn't a complete asshole. I just want to say a few things about my beautiful sister, Mary Charlotte. Mary Charlotte lived the gospel. As most of you probably know, she didn't have the money to feed every poor person in Texas, but she could teach parents how to feed their children nutritious food on a budget. She did that as a job. I don't know if what she did made any difference on a macro level, but she had a refrigerator door covered in thank you cards from parents, parents whose kids had graduated from high school, graduated from college, got a great job, bought a house. What would Jesus do? I think he would have done what Mary Charlotte did. I think Mary Charlotte didn't like me a lot sometimes. <laughs> I have a temper. I can be difficult to deal with when I get angry, which is often. She had endless patience with me. She didn't always like me, but I knew that she always loved me. When I was crying once and told her I didn't believe in God anymore, she didn't get mad at me. She didn't try to convince me of anything. She didn't tell me to get out of her house. She hugged me. If the Jesus story is even true, I think that's what Jesus would have done. I think he would have hugged me. I don't have kids myself but I loved her kids. She let me babysit them because she knew I would guard them with my life. And Trevor and Jamie, if you're there and you can hear me, that's still true. I would guard you with my life. And Mary Charlotte, if you can hear me, thank you for loving me. I can't believe you're gone. And I love you so.
So I went to a party the other day, like most parties. It got late and it dwindled down to the last seven or eight people, you know, the real friends. So after the folks from work and the neighbors you don't really like and the one lady you always invite hoping she'll bring those homemade tamales, it's after they're all gone. So anyway, we were sitting around the fire pit in Pete's backyard and the wind chimes were singing in the breeze and the crickets too. Someone suggested we have a round of telling ghost stories, you know, spooky, scary, such as that. Well, Pete was the host, so he went first, and he told us kind of a haunted house deal. It wasn't too bad. There's a man and a woman, and they buy an old home they want to renovate. But what they don't know is that before the house was built in the 30s, the land was the site of an old orphanage. And a little after World War I, the place burned down, and some of the kids perished in the fire. So they get to working on this place, and they're scrubbing the floorboards and working on the plumbing, the whole bit, and no sooner than they get started, weird shit starts happening, right? Like uh, electrical fires and people falling off ladders swearing they were pushed. You know, supplies coming up missing. The weirdest thing was that every morning when the man and woman would wake up, there were little gray hand and footprints everywhere. They were on the floors, on the walls, hell, even on the ceilings. They were gray, like ash. <laughs> well, that was enough for Pete's wife. Well, Sarah just finished her wine and went to bed. And Charlie Reber tried to tell us one about a haunted rodeo, but that didn't go over so well, probably because he was drunk. And Trudy Honeycutt, oh, oh, Trudy, yeah, she got a big laugh when she said that her worst nightmare would be to wake up one day and realize she married a Republican. I didn't find that too goddamn funny, but... I was outnumbered. Anyway, then it was my turn, so uh, I took a sip of my Jack Daniels and I started in. There was this guy. Right? He was married, had kids the whole bit. He was a good father, good husband, provider, you know, he had a good job. Anyway, every year between Christmas and New Year's, his company would give him the week off. So every year after the family Christmas, but before New Year's Eve, he take a little time to himself. He'd pack up his truck and he'd go deer hunting. And he had lots of friends and stuff, sure, but on these trips, he went alone. This is the way he wanted it. He'd camp or maybe find a little motel somewhere and it was never very crowded that time of year, so it was fine. He just, he wanted to get out there, you know, like deep in the woods, no city sounds, just listen to the birds and the crickets, whatever. You know. And it was peaceful, he didn't sleep much. But whenever he did sleep, he was up early with that big sunrise and he was drinking coffee. You know. They were called hunting trips. But, uh, wasn't a lot of hunting getting done. He had two really nice deer rifles, but on these trips, they didn't see much use. He'd really just spend the time hiking in the woods, kind of taking it in, looking around, seeing what had changed over the year. Because he always went to the same place. He'd spend his days napping or maybe reading a book that he brought from home, you know, always drinking coffee, lots of coffee, because he was waiting for twilight. He was waiting for that time when the sky goes from blue to orange to red to black. So when all the stars come out, maybe a little moonlight, the crickets start in, maybe a little wind, you know. Some years a lot of wind. But every year it was the same. You know, it'd get dark and get quiet and start waiting. And he was waiting for him, the boy, the older boy, in the plaid jacket and the blue jeans and the scuffed up boots. Now the hunter, he was a grown man. The boy was 14. Well, he wasn't going to get any older. He'd always be 14, but he'd always be known as the older boy. So anyway, every year he'd, he'd go out there and he'd just be waiting and thinking. You know, like, here I am. Maybe this year he wouldn't show. And then after a while, the wind would pick up a little bit, and make it a little colder than it was before, okay, no matter what the temperature. And he'd hear footsteps, maybe some rustling. And the older boy would step out from behind a tree or some brush, maybe knock some leaves out of his hair and he'd hold his hand out to him. Well, the hunter knew that the boy was asking if he had any water for him. So they would 
find a log or a stump. Some years they just sit on the ground and pass the canteen back and forth. Just soak it in. Listen to the owls. You know, listen to the night. And they would talk. Now the younger boy, which is the hunter, he did most of the talking. You know, it wasn't earth-shattering stuff, and it really wasn't always uh, kids' concerns either. You know, he looked up to the older boy, and he was looking for some advice, maybe how to feel about things, how to think about something. No matter what they talked about, the younger boy, the hunter, you, you always felt better. After a while, you know, it uh, would get a little darker, a little higher in the sky, maybe the wind would pick up and the older boy would stand up. That was it. The visit was over. But before it was done, before the older boy had gone back into the dark, the younger boy was already looking forward to the next year. That was my story. They liked it all right. Pete said it wasn't that scary, but hell, I already knew that. You know? Anyway, we were drunk and tired, and the fire was petering out, so it was time to go home. Till next time, we said. Here's what I didn't tell him. The background of that story. The truth of it. When I was growing up, it was a family a couple of doors down. It was the Phillips. And, uh, it was a mom and a dad, and they had two sons. It was Chuck and Rory. Now, Chuck was 18, and he wasn't very nice. You know, he was, hell, Chuck was a dick. But Rory, in my opinion, he was the greatest kid I'd ever met. You know, he was athletic, he was outdoorsy, good-looking kid, and most of all, he was nice to me. I was just in elementary school, but hell, Rory would talk to me. So anyway, one year, uh, Mr. Phillips asked if Dad and I would like to go hunting with him and Rory. Well, hell yeah, oh, we'd love to. So we went, it was a great time, it was, it was, it was perfect. The hunt went really well, and you know, mainly I just enjoyed hanging out with Rory, but it was a great time. And came around to the last day, and our dads told us we had about an hour before it was time to leave, so hell, Rory and I were already talking about coming back the next year. And I don't, I don't know how it happened. Because Mr. Phillips was a good hunter. I mean, he knew everything about guns. I thought he did. Anyway, somehow his rifle went off. And we didn't know it for a minute, but he had hit Rory. And he hit him in the throat. And Roy just fell back on the ground and he didn't understand. And there was blood all down the front of him. And for a moment, he looked right in my eyes before my dad pulled me back and he asked me for some water and he said he was thirsty. They loaded Rory in the back of the truck and I saw him through the back glass and I knew he was dead long before we got into town. Mr. and Miss Phillips got a divorce and they moved away. That's all I knew. For one year, I was 19, it was my freshman year, and I told my parents that I was gonna go deer hunting after Christmas with some buddies. But I really just went alone and I've been going back every year since. And no, it's not a scary story. It's not a scary story at all. But I'll tell you this, every time I go, if I'm out there in those woods after sunset and I am thinking, here I am, he'll show up, he will be there no doubt.